And now we're going to have a very interesting, and I'm told a very rare conversation with both the director and the deputy director of NGA. And to facilitate this discussion, we have one of the most preeminent geography professors in the country, AGS counselor, Dr. Alec Murphy. Alec, everybody is very eager for your session. Thanks. Thank you, John. And uh, let me first just welcome to the stage our, our two panelists. As, uh, as John mentioned, it's pretty rare, I think, to get both the director and the deputy, deputy director of the National Geospatial Intelligence uh, Agency here on the same stage. So this is a very uh, wonderful moment this morning. First, um, you, you have bios of these people in your packet, so I'm not going to go into any great length, but Robert Cardillo, the director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, uh, long-time involvement with various aspects in, of intelligence, including formerly with the Defense Intelligence Agency. He studied at, at Cornell and Georgetown. So please welcome Robert Cardillo. And long-timers will remember he was here for the very first uh, Geography 2 2050 session two years ago when we were over in the Law Library. And then I'm delighted to welcome back from last year Susan or Sue Gordon, uh, Deputy Director of the NGA. Welcome, Susan. Susan, also a long-time career uh, in, involving aspects of intelligence with the, with the federal government, the CIA, before, before the NGA. Well, this session is linking geospatial technologies, the NGA, and issues of conservation sustainability. And that might seem a little bit odd or surprising to some, because when we think about geospe geospatial technology in the context of the NGA, I think we usually think about, oh, tracking suspected terrorists around the world, providing the support for the American counterparts of James Bond to do their jobs, and, you know, and, and, and the like. But, uh, and of course, security is part of the picture that we may be talking about today, but what's also relevant is the work that's being done to issues of conservation and sustainability and even to humanitarian relief projects. And we're going to hear something about uh, all those things uh, this morning. I know from conversations with, uh, with Robert and, and Susan that uh, you're going to hear about the NGA's commitment to broadening the understanding of the agency's role in matters relevant to sustainability uh, and making data publicly available that will help with some of the kinds we've, of issues that we've heard about in this conference, such as wildlife trafficking. I want to say that even though I'm the moderator here, I'm no particular specialist on this area, though I I uh, do know the, uh, the NGA is doing something right because they recently hired one of my doctoral students. Um, and uh, as a political geographer, of course, I'm interested in things that are relevant to the types of work that the, that the NGA is, is, is doing. So uh, let me, without further ado, turn the podium over to Robert Cardello, who will be our first speaker, and he will be followed by, by Sue, and then we should have a chance for some back and forth over the themes that they develop. Thank you, Alec. Thanks very much. Um, it really is uh, thrilling for us to be here. Uh, this is my thrilling face. Um, be, <laughs> just have to know that. Uh, but seriously, this is, this is a room uh, full of our future. Um, this, you, your intellectual drive, your uh, innovation, your uh, academic engagement, your, your studies, your analyses, are the fuel uh, that will take the profession where it must go. And I'm here to talk to you today about where we are and, that, and part of that equation. Uh, but what I remind my team at NGA is that the advancement, the innovation, uh, the technology insertion that's going to drive our profession to where it must go is going to happen more, more on the outside than on the inside. And it's you that I'm speaking about. You're doing it. You will do it. And so what Sue and I are here today is to share a little bit about where we are. Uh, but then we'd love to uh, engage you all in a discussion about how we can enhance that partnership uh, going forward. So a little bit about us. Um, uh, we're 20 years old. Uh, and we're 200 years old. And we're 2,000 years old. Um, but just in uh, our country's context, 
if you go to the next slide. Um, many people uh, consider the gentleman on the left the father of our country. Uh, we consider him to be employee number one. Uh, as a surveyor, as a mapper, uh, as a, uh, a one who actually uh, employed the use, the knowledge of the terrain in order to advance both his economic prosperity but then our military security in effect, uh, George Washington was at the forefront. Uh, Lewis and Clark are part of our tradition. Uh, one third of our agency, as a matter of fact, is located in St. Louis, where they began their expedition in 1804 uh, and where they returned in 1806. And by the way, even then, that was yes about exploration, yes about science, yes about discovery, and yes about intelligence. As a matter of fact, Thomas Jefferson created uh, coded language for them to send back their reports because of the sensitivity of the mission. And that's, uh, that's 214 years ago. Uh, from there to Civil War, the advent of reconnaissance balloons to understand the adversary's positions in advance uh, of a decision that needed to be made. And then, of course, the Cuban Missile Crisis, one of the finest hours of one of our predecessor organizations, the National Photographic Interpretation Center. And what they enabled through that exploitation of that photography of those missile systems in Cuba were to let President Kennedy act before events dictate. Act before events dictate. And that's what we do today. And so we're proud of that history. Um, uh, but we're also mindful that not all of that history is good. Next, please. So we're a little over 100 years from this agreement that this room is well familiar with. And it is perhaps one of the most tragic decisions made uh, in the void of not just geography, but more importantly, uh, human geography. Uh, and that reminds us all of the effect of when we don't provide the right foundation and context and frame for the decisions that need to be made, that the ramifications can be uh, disastrous. Now, if we fast forward into current time, next please, you'll begin to see uh, a snapshot of our homepage, nga.mil. This is our worldwide web page. Um, and of course, we've got a classified mission. Uh, Alec referenced some of the tasks that we do. Uh, and that, w that does and will be sustained going forward. There will always be a role for our agency to provide that exquisite, exclusive, uh, differentiated set of analysis for very particular forms of uh, missions. But more and more, we know we need to figure out how do we take that success in that closed space and move it to the open. And not just succeed in the open, but succeed with the open. And again, that's one of the driving reasons Sue and I are here today, to continue the conversation with both of you. Um, you saw some of the Arctic work that we had done in the past year or so. Um, Predominantly uh, as a result of our uh, collaboration with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, the National Geographic Society, the National Science Foundation, University of Minnesota's Polar Geospatial Center, and others, to create navigational data for polar expeditions, to, have, to uh, release remote sensing data for analysis without the nece necessary field deployment, to take data that could be used for meteorological, climatological, and environmental assessments. And, we've, and now for the past seven years, we've been able to provide the Science Foundation with imagery uh, acquired via, via our mission partner, Digital Globe, uh, to support that polar science understanding uh, up through the University of Minnesota. Now, if you go to the next slide, you'll see another example of what we're able to do uh, with our mission partner, Digital Globe. Um, 2015 was one of the worst fire seasons ever in Washington and Oregon, over 4,000 wildfires during that season. Um, what you'll see here is a way to take a part of the spectrum that Digital Globe has developed and apply shortwave infrared to penetrate the smoke and identify the hottest spots to guide the fire, uh, those who are fighting the fire. And again, we just want them to be able to act before events dictate. And so it's an application of a commercial innovation through a government contract and our use to provide back to those uh, that need it most. 
If you go to the next slide, um, you'll go, we'll go back to uh, April of 2015. Within 24 hours of that earthquake, we were able to post on our World Wide Web over 240 da data layers on top of 46 continuously updated maps. We also had a portal to enable those who were either contributing to the effort, whether it was the United Kingdom, uh, the Department of Defense, the Department of State, uh, or Canada, to add their data uh, onto our data sets as well. Um, what you'll see here uh, is, the, is our ability to provide before and after to let those doing first rescue operations uh, to, to know how to focus their efforts and then recovery operations. And the idea here is to save lives and to help millions recover. And then one year before that, we supported uh, the president's call uh, to fight the Ebola virus in Liberia. You may remember that the 101st Airborne Division was deployed in order to support the, the, uh, the construction of emergency technical units, ETUs. And here are the outcome that we sought. Okay, the objective was we had to shorten the time between symptom and diagnosis and then diagnosis and treatment. And the only way that was going to happen or the way that was gonna, we were going to be able to shorten that as much as possible is getting those units, those ETUs, to the place where we knew or were we informed by the human geography where people could get to, they could have access to these units in order to, once the diagnosis was made, those that had uh, were positive could get immediately into treatment and equally important, those that didn't could get uh, again uh, away from the, uh, uh, the possibility of further contamination. By the way, this was posted on the World Wide Web. No username, no password. Because while we were serving those in uni uniform, which we're used to doing, the uniforms were white lab coats. And they don't uh, really uh, have uh, common access cards and uh, tokens, et cetera. We had to make it as simple as possible. Now, Ebola isn't the only disease we've mapped. Uh, Haiti is one of those places, unfortunately, that we've uh, served often. This map shows the 2010 cholera epidemic. And then more recently, when Hurricane Matthew hit, hit through the western end, uh, we once again went on the World Wide Web and posted layers, layered products, uh, maps and charts, and again, portals to allow others to input as well. Now, just two months ago, we started uh, an engagement with one of the newer companies in our community, uh, Planet, now called Planet, formerly called Planet Labs, who operate the, uh, a fleet of small satellites with uh, grosser resolution. Um, now we have access to their data, and we're going through some testing and evaluation to see what we can determine through software application and algorithmic development about what change we can detect. And in this case, uh, an opportunity to see the difference before and after around Hurricane uh, Matthew, but in the next case, to also see the effect, on the next slide, of the extent of the expansion of illegal mining camps uh, in Peru. And again, the, the, it isn't the, the detail here, but it's the indicator of. Once we have the indication of, we can go to other parts of our team, uh, be they commercial or government or local, uh, and focus our attention where it's needed. So think of it as a broader queuing device. And then lastly, just a reminder um, that we've also done extraterrestrial. Uh, in advance of the exploration of the moon, uh, one of our legacy organizations uh, worked in the 60s uh, to do uh, lunar mapping and eventually working on uh, moon landing sites. This was through photos acquired from lunar orbiters one through five. And again, it just, uh, uh, while it was uh, sensitive at the time, more and more of this capability is, is generally available. And what we're here to say is that uh, we're looking to where, where and how we can expose more of our capabilities uh, conflate those with yours uh, and create uh, a better planet. And speaking of the planet, I'm now going to turn the podium over to Sue uh, to talk about some of the GIS applications that we're doing uh, here on planet Earth. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I too am grateful for Dr. Murphy and am 
also thrilled to be here with the uh, American Geographical Society. This is my thrilled face between Robert and I. We have the emotional spectrum of a normal human. Um, uh, listen, I've been at NGA for a little more than two years, um, and I'm amazed at what we've accomplished in bringing what we call intelligence information out into the open. Uh, I don't think it's hyperbolic uh, to say that this move of the last two years that Robert articulated um, is actually the foundation of the transformation that will not only help serve the causes of sustainability and global security that we're talking about will actually will transform the manner in which we serve our more traditional customers well. In fact, this openness is showing us what collective contribution can do. Um, um, and, and I will say that um, as you listen to my short presentation, what I want, I'm going to, I'm going to do the the talk about the what we have that underlies what we've been able to do. And as I talk about this, what I want you all to do is to tar start thinking about what you would do with that. Uh, I've been in this business a long time, and what I used to say is the intelligence community and national security community lays challenges on the public-private sector to come up with solutions to those challenges. This is a little bit of a reverse. We're going to show what we have, and I want the challenges to come from you. Because for all the things that Robert mentioned that are awfully good, we don't want to stop where we are. And in fact, if you think about the things that he articulated, there's a little bit of a reactive nature in what we've done. When the DePaul earthquake happened, we made our data available to that. When one of the most underserved regions of the Arctic came into play, we made our data available there, but it is still slightly after the fact. I think our collective challenge and our offer to you, and what I'd love to talk with you all about when we sit down, is how do we flip that a little bit? And I know there's a little bit of queasiness anytime the government says we're here to help particularly when that comes from the intelligence community, but this one is really where I think we have an awful lot of things that we can bring. So the next slide. Um, NGA's motto is to know the earth, show the way, understand the world. Um, that motto was excellent 20 years ago. It is really good today, and it conveys incredibly well to the future, because you would agree with me that we don't know everything we need to know about the earth. And we are not showing the way in all the ways that we might, and certainly we do not understand human activity in the way that we are going to be required to in order to face the challenges of the world. Um, the cool thing is we have a lot of data uh, collected over time, um, and we did so in support of our intelligence combat support missions. Um, but increasingly, it is useful for far broader purpose. Um, we are actively involved, as you can see, in dealing with climate securities, environmental hazards, food and water security, as well as natural resources and land use. Uh, for example, we have had in the past year alone symposia on water, climate, food, combating wildlife trafficking to harness the advanced data collections that we have and to apply the analytic methods of the private sector, of government and non-governmental agencies to it. We think we can provide some answers. Our entire organizational ethos, as Robert articulated, is to arm decision makers with data so they can make better informed choices. And in this case, to enhance the sustainability and security of the world. And as I mentioned, we tend to be in reactive mode, but let's see if as a collective we can change that. We're helping first responders. We're helping military responders. We're helping policymakers. Who more can we help? And if we do it together, we will realize the full potential of GIS, and it makes the world a better place. So let me give you a few examples of the things we work with. Next. So everything for us starts with foundational data. It's the key to our, these efforts because it provides the baseline for increasing in our predictive ability. 
And just as with national security, predictive ability is the coin of the realm. It is good to know what is going on now. It is far better to know what we believe will happen as we go forward. And if we can recognize indicators far enough in advance, we can potentially avert some crises by action. NGA creates, maintains, and refines many environmental data sets. We use these layers to build new models or provide context for our customers. Uh, you can see on the slide here an example of how we maintain these environmental data sets to develop global soil maps, as well as other critical environmental information. Predictive modeling has allowed us to successfully use snow cover to predict fl floods or famine, which in turn affects the ecosystem and human geography. But our ability to anticipate and take action to proactively prevent or respond to potential di disruptions can be improved. So let me take another a look at some of our other um, environmental initiatives. Here's one on food security. And we're using, beginning to use the power of big data analytics in order to advance this cause. Uh, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, is a simple geographical indicator that can be used to analyze remote sensing measurements and assess whether the, or not the target being observed contains live green vegetation. And then we take these historical vegetation health, um, health data to address food security issues. In this case, the data show that multiple droughts in Ethiopia clearly affect the grass, grasslands and contribute to their current political crises. Next slide. Now, by mapping these data, we can determine which grass, grasslands are most heavily affected by the droughts and provide a larger geospatial context that allows to localize the data to regions and then what? Allow action to follow, because that actually is the point. It is good to know. It is far better to use. In the next slide, you can see we have other models to assess environmental impact as well. For example, we monitor water resources for water security issues. And using climactic data and underlying environment factors, such as elevation and soil types, we can estimate ground depth to groundwater resources. And this can be useful for planning purposes, as you know, such as identifying potential drinking water sources. Next. Now, I believe that everything I just showed, someone in this room knows and uses. This one might be new, new to you. This is a map of anti-neutrinos. Um, and in fact, this is our produced anti-neutrino map. Now, you may want to know what anti-neutrinos are. And in fact, you may want to know why NGA has antipathy toward actual neutrinos. Yeah, it was a little, I don't know. I wasn't sure if it would work either, and, and it didn't. <laughs> neutrino, anti-neutrino. Anyway, anti-neutrinos are actually subatomic particles um, that are produced by stars of all kinds, including the sun, supernova, and in fact, the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and they are key to meaningful geologic research into the Earth's, Earth's heat sources. And that's, in fact, what this is. It is an incredibly important foundational piece, to under, piece of understanding our Earth and its temperature and what happens. But what it can also be used for is nuclear reactors and radioactive elements also produce anti-neutrinos. And so we have an interesting combination here of something that is actually very good in terms of understanding the geologic processes, but may hold the potential for understanding human activities as well and protect things. So when you think about the, all the layers of maps, layers of information data we have, it is not just the surface, it is also things as interesting and complex as anti-neutrino half spins compared to their cousin leptons, the neutrinos. I'll be having a talk on this and that <laughs> in the lobby afterwards. All right, from anti-neutrinos to wildlife trafficking. I know, that's right. Um, so why wildlife trafficking? Two-thirds of the nations of the world are, around, are at risk of instability, degradation, climate change, and migrant moving, and this provides an incredibly rich environment for wildlife trafficking because poachers and terrorist networks exploit that instability. And the initiatives that we're pursuing in this area, much like some of the others that Robert talked about, include using available acoustical sensors to track wildlife movement, a handheld app for field data connection, and NGA portals that include real-time data feeds of collared elephant data. So much like the other portals that Robert talked about, with the Arctic, 
with Hurricane Matthew, this is just another way that communities of interest can have access to our data and contribute to the collective wisdom. Next slide. We couldn't make it, they refused to make it as full as our partnerships really are. But we aren't kidding when we say that we are well aware that there is no chance in the universe that NGA alone can tackle the issues of national security, much less global security and sustainability alone. These are just some of the people with whom we work. And I will tell you, a partnership isn't a one-way thing. Partnership, the real question is, is what problems that can we, can, can, can we take on that require us to create together? It isn't you doing something for us. It isn't actually even us doing something for you. It is something that we can collectively pursue that produces something that wouldn't otherwise exist. Um, to further improve our ability to anticipate and predict, we are engaged with innovation centers in Silicon Valley in Boston, and we just had a great session uh, at Civic Hall with, uh, because New York itself is such a hotbed of innovation, particularly in GIS areas and things that we can use. Um, and the, really, uh, the idea here is it's not just the data, but how do you act on the data, and what's the intersection of technologies and that data that allow us to have more knowledge than we otherwise would. So I'm going to leave you with the idea of NGA increasingly is working to become a broker, making our data more available for use. We have a lot of it. We don't need to have that data be used in an attributed fashion. It can be used in a non-attributed fashion. But we need some help in prioritizing the areas that demand our participation. So with that, I think I'm going to sit down, remind you of the spectrum of what you heard between Robert and me. From the history, to the intention, to the activities, to the foundation, to the partnership that allow us to contribute to the issue that brought you here to this conference. Sustainability, global security, it is all part of the same continuum. And we think we're a decent addition to that community. Thanks a lot. Let's all collectively think a little bit about this challenge of helping prioritize. I want to open it up to some questions from the audience. Uh, uh, but I'd like to ask a, maybe a, a bit of a larger framing question, which um, might get us started here. Um, it's obvious to, I'm sure, most people in this room that when one thinks about environmental issues, this is not a whole separate realm from security and stability issues. But for a lot of people, that, that is a, they don't think in that, those terms. A lot of people think of security issues and environmental issues as pretty different arenas, including, I would guess, some of the traditional clients of the, of the NGA. So, I guess the question is, how much progress do you feel that you're making in shifting that calculus? What are you worried about? And to what extent can environmental issues kind of be in the driver's seat of things, new initiatives you're going to take, or do you always kind of have to put the mm -hmm. security thing first and let the environment follow? So it's a great question. Um, I'll start. Mm -hmm. You'll fix it. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of the contract. This is our thing. Yeah. You're gonna, you get to watch. <laughs> uh, let's use the, the Arctic, right? That we've had now almost two years of intensive work. Oh, and by the way, I didn't even mention Antarctica. We're working there and will be a continued focus for us. But Arctic, especially to your question. So uh, it is not this agency's responsibility to explain why the ice is melting. But we need to understand the implications of that melted ice, right? Uh, some of it is social and cultural and territorial, et cetera. Others of it, it creates new maritime sea lanes that didn't exist before. Those sea lanes can be used for at least two reasons, right? Um, economic enhancement, shorter routes to move goods from you know, production to consumption. Okay, there's an economic benefit. Uh, on the other hand, 
open sea routes can be used by militaries, right, to provide access to threats and opportunities and challenges. Second piece of this, so it's both, and, and, and we're responsible for showing both. Secondarily, that, that receding ice creates uh, uh, opportunities for natural resource exploitation that didn't exist before. It was prohibitive, expensive, or dangerous, et cetera. Because of the contest that exists over the claimants of that, right, you know, that's gonna create tension. When tensions rise, sometimes sabers rattle, right? When sabers rattle, sometimes they're actually employed. So it's my responsibility as, as the agency head to, again, do both. Yep, that's accessible. And here's the reality of the military activity that's now happening around that. And there is. There is increased Russian activity in the Arctic now uh, because of the receding ice line. So I hope that answered your question, that we accept that it's both. Um, and we do think that our customers are beginning to They're appreciate, that, yeah. appreciate that there is a confluence. There's nothing to fix there. Uh, I'll give you an and, though. Uh, it is, it does resolve to a question of resources, mm -hmm. right? So in addition to the uh, philosophical question of who should be doing what, it comes down to what we spend resources. One of the things I would say in this area, uh, there, are many, there are many situations where we have to lead. This is one where we can be foundational. And what's so important about making our data available openly, and whether that is through our websites or whether that's on GitHub with source code so people can interact with it, it is allowing the possibility that it isn't all work that we're going to do on it to make the advance. Our contribution may, in fact, end up being just making the available data available for use where disproportionately the work on it is done not by the exact same resources. So I think, I think in that there's some balance too. Mm -hmm. um, and fundamentally is in the direction that the government is supposed to go with is if you have something, you're supposed to make it available for public use. And I think what we found something there. So just think that one, we're not letting you off the hook when we say we're making it available and we say we're interested in questions of prioritization. Don't think, great, they should be doing that too. No, 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 maybe it's we should be doing it. Interesting just to think about the links between what you were talking about and even some of the earlier presentations. So we're hearing that talk about forest uh, mm -hmm. loss mm -hmm. in eastern uh, Congo. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a conflict zone that clearly has implications for uh, stability, but also, of course, for, for forest loss. So you know, these kinds of links are, are, are all over the place. Well, well let's you know, just add while you open it up, too. The, the National Intelligence Council recently put out an estimate unclassified estimate on worldwide water security. Uh, the idea being, okay, the, the core assumption being that, that, that we, we, conflicts will erupt, have erupted and will continue up, we think, greater in the future. So it's both. Uh, it has to be managed uh, in order to manage the, uh, the security issue as well. So let's throw it open to ideas, responses to questions that have been uh, raised. There's or well, we're just so thrilled that there's more than one. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> thanks, and, and uh, it, it's really amazing to see what uh, you know, a couple of years of work to open things up uh, can do. Uh, I guess my question is that that's still a first step mm -hmm. to use, is mm -hmm. getting access and making access, both internally and externally. And so uh, I guess the question is, internally, what's been your biggest challenge in actually integrating all different types of human, environmental, mm -hmm. security data? Mm -hmm. And uh, what can this community do to kind of help you on those biggest challenges? So we'll split up the answer again. Uh, my answer is mindset. Um, I mean, we're, we're a large organization, right? So you can imagine our demographic curve, you know, is, is, is spread. But the leadership of my organization kind of looks like me and Sue, right? So we were raised in an era when this never happened, yeah. right? As a matter of fact, you were trained to make sure this never happened. <laughs> no, we actively worked to make sure this didn't happen, right? Actually, so, it was horrible. And so... So while intellectually, I think my teammates can appreciate 
the value proposition of this conversation, it's just not natural. It is so unnatural. So one of the reasons why the deputy and the director are here in New York City today is yes to talk to you, but we are beaming this back to our headquarters, right? Look, it's okay, all right? So far, okay. <laughs> no, no, no harm came. Okay, it's uh, we can have it. So, so that's what I'll say. I'll ask Sue to talk about the technical challenges. And, and look, they're real, and the policy challenges are real, and the security challenges are real. But my top answer is mindset. And they did assure me that they wouldn't have to kill me after I agreed to moderate the panel. Yeah, and they told sure. me what was going to go on. So. So, Tony, I think there was a question over here. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you both for coming. So, as I realized that you both would be speaking, I was contemplating a question that I could ask that would be the nexus in the Venn diagram between the theme of the conference and, of course, NJ's uh, uh, established uh, history. So, I'll posit a, a, a question, and there is a question here. Um, so, <laughs> an argument could be made, perhaps only by me, that uh, Boko Haram might not have uh, come to existence had the oil companies done what they said that they would do when they were granted the concession in Nigeria, had they not spoiled the water and kind of ravaged the earth, if you will, that there wouldn't have been such discontent in the local communities in the Delta, which caused them to then rebel and, as we can see now, right, they're affiliated or have, have pledged pledge allegiance to, uh, to ISIS. So what is NGA's, or does NGA have a role in not only advising leadership to that potential, you know, uh, pound, uh, penny wise, pound foolish concept, and or industry in terms of maybe ad advising or, or uh, suggesting strongly about behaving uh, better uh, kind of on the global stage? How about if I start any of this? Um, so I think, and, and I'll, there's an answer here <laughs> to, to play up here. Um, I think what is, is so exciting about this moment um, is our ability to actually understand the relationships of activities and processes that are going on on the earth in a view that allows us to prove or disprove your assertion that those two activities were related. And to see human activity and natural processes in a way to be able to give that advice. So when you have the emergent satellite comp uh, companies talking about being able to look at the Earth every day, when you talk about analytics that are allow me going to correlate change and in a way that allows me to perhaps predict what's going to happen, I think that is what excites us about operating more openly, gathering more data, making it be able to play with each other so we can see these things, so that we can, with confidence, with whatever analysis we show, put it in the larger context, because over time, in the past, we were giving advice with a very narrow, relatively narrow frame around it. What we're talking about here, what we're talking about when we project forward is being able to see it all in action, to model much bigger things than just what's happening in geographically, and then be able to provide that better advice. So I believe that the whole of the national security, security's responsibility, not just NGA, we have a piece of it, is to actually provide that sort of wisdom that you suggest so that we can make better national decisions across the public-private partnership. Our role and what we're proffering here is we think the moment is coming where we can put activities in context in a digestible form so that you can start making that. You wanna fix it? And? Yeah. Two years ago, over in the rotunda, I probably used a phrase called the darkening skies. I thought that was cool, you know, because all the satellites were going to fly and it was going to cast a shadow on the earth and all that. And it was wrong. It's the wrong phrase because what those, what that, what that access is providing is a transparency that we've never had. And to me, 
I think to us, evil struggles in the light. We should be part of that exposition. And I think to your question, my answer is yes. Now, Sue's right too. We have to posit the case. We have to look at the evidence, et cetera. But, but our job should be shedding that light, creating the conditions to understand that it's more than just a terrorist group. Uh, there's a much broader ecosystem in every sense of the word. I think that's a, actually a great question and response, because to me, part of what this is all about and why it's, why it's interesting and important is the opportunity to open up new questions. Mm -hmm. You open up new questions when you stop thinking about just, yeah. here's the data we've always looked at, so we'll yeah. keep looking right. at it. Right. But you start actually seeing connections because you're right. starting to in broaden what you're looking at and how, how those things are related to each other. Yes, another question over here. Um, as uh, remote sensing becomes more and more privatized, there's more and more companies coming out and doing this, looking at like a three to five year time horizon in the future, um, as it relates to, to your group and, and to what both of you do, do you see a greater need for more frequent, more uh, higher resolution access to more data, or do you see more of a need for decision making tools, analytics models, and those sorts of things in the future? I mean, I know both are very critical, <laughs> but sort of looking three years in the future, five years in the future, which of those do you think there's going to be a much greater need for? Well, I don't want to choose. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, don't want, I don't want to choose <laughs> both, of course. Uh... But, I, but well, I'll just say, though, I, I guess I worry more about the latter. Yeah. We're, we're, we are getting greater and greater data accesses, and, 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 and all of us now have, you know, have better temporal history and better you know, geographic expanse and whatnot. Uh, it feels to me yeah. like we don't have, now, by the way, I'd be love to be proved wrong by this room, OK? <laughs> that the advances on that algorithmic side, okay, on that application side, aren't in the same place. No, that's exactly what I was gonna say. I, data are being produced all the time, and, and really exciting for us is it's not, it's not being produced just at our demand. I mean, 60 years ago, in order to get this, we had to have the requirement and, and basically commission it now. And then build it and then build it, and then, and then get it, and then do a cost trade in terms of what the value it, right? And so it was relatively limited. What's happening now is there is the production of data because the value of that, you know, this is so much, this is even better than the space program that produced, you know, Tang and Velcro. You know, this is, this is far beyond that. So I think the data are being produced, and that's, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's not that it's all that we will ever need, but it allows us to focus on some pretty things. But I, as Robert said, we, haven't, we are just beginning to imagine the questions that could be answered. And those questions will require some pretty good analytics to go with it. So I think I'm, I'm with him. Both are necessary. I want more and more data. I want different spectral regions. I want, so it, it isn't just what is going to be commercial available. But we don't have the wherewithal to put together the answers without the advance of analytics. Thank you. We're running a bit short on time, but we have one or two more very quick questions or comments. Uh, somewhat related to that, um, Sue, in particular, you've used the phrase from maps to models. Uh -huh. And here we're in a room full of geographers who love maps and understand maps and the like. We could probably say that we have a less collective understanding yeah. of models and how yeah. to make them interoperable and prevent uh, the province associated with them. What do we need to do both technically and uh, with our staffs uh, to make yeah. models as understandable as maps? All right, so I love maps too. Um, third child of a naval officer, so maybe nautical charts were more my thing, sure. but still, <laughs> still I'd put it in the same realm. Um, when I talk about models, I'm really talking about you need the ability to test, query, find interactions, uh, a dynamism that is maybe multiple maps. What we need to do is we need to understand various processes, be able to create a model of that process. We need to have a model of the Earth so we can put those together, act on top, be able to. We need many more of us. I, here's my tagline. It's 2016, gang. All of us are technical. 
right? All of us are going to have to advance in our understanding of the technical disciplines, whether it's data science or coding, or whatever. We're just going to have to all get there because that is what's going to be required in order for us to understand what we see in the manner that we need. Um, but it does start with a foundational understanding of the earth and human activities, and then you parse it down into how you model those, because I want to have a queryable earth, right? I want to be able to qu ask questions about what if and what happens, and I think that's what's going to happen next. I think there was one more we could take as the last one right here. Hi. Um, yeah, so I, I was just wondering if you could talk to us a little bit more about how you plan on structuring the open data sources. I mean, I know that I can speak to anybody that works with data that we can always use more. Um, so I'm encouraged by your enthusiasm for open data, open data platforms. <laughs> but I'm just sort of wondering We're how bringing. you're planning on structuring that. Um, and also, as somebody that has to return to Ohio this uh, Thanksgiving for uncomfortable conversations, I'm wondering. Uh, if you guys would be willing to weigh in on whether you see climate change as being a national security threat and the way that, uh, that you guys might sort of interact in that discussion. You start off, Paul. Well, actually, I'll take the last. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I will. Okay. And, That's um, a good question. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, go, go back to my, you know, discussion around the Arctic. It, It's not even a valid question. It is. If the climate changes, our security calculus changes. It just does. So the question is how and how we deal with it. And, and I don't mean deal with it scientifically, okay? I'm just talking about a pure security geek now, right? Just, you know, we, I've got to create conditions that advance the US military's capability to project power, right? Or to defend or to ally. All of that, okay, happens. <laughs> with respect to, in confluence with, the environment. So I would never say it's a silly question to somebody, or my boss, for example, right? I would, I would say, well, it's an interesting question, you know? Let me, let's, let's look at it this way, you know? I, I frame it a little bit. Um, and, and let me say, that was our position yesterday and today and tomorrow. So for us, there's no change. For us, there's no change. What we showed you today, well, hopefully we will show you next year, but somebody, okay, uh, you know, from our agency uh, will, will be here to continue this conversation. I'm quite confident of that. On the data standards, so we have an officer that is our National Geospatial Officer for uh, GWINT standards. So he, I don't know, I don't, yeah, right now he, but, but whoever, operate in that role, um, is basically leading that charge to make sure that our data are able to play in the manner they need to. Um, totally committed to OGC standards. Um, but what we're increasingly aware of, and, we, and our historical press on standards has been for the military intelligence communities, right? That's been our press. What is really obvious now is the dynamism of data types being produced and whether even the OGC standards are going to be sufficient for the interactions that we need. So I think that's when I, when I talk about wanting to engage in terms of what of our data sets are interesting, it is in part to exactly your point is what standards do we need to apply to make sure that they're going to be able to participate in the way they need to. And your, your comment about history, right. one of the most interesting, right. responding to your question about priorities, right. one of the most interesting things to the research community is maybe some of the historical data Absolutely. you have yeah. because it's one thing to have an interesting map. Right. It's another thing right. to see how that map changes, changes over time. time. And we you do. guys may have things that we, do. we don't we do. have. We do. we do. And that, I, 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 I would put you that. You should be comforted by that, not disturbed yeah, by I that. I would put that at the head of the, of the priority yeah, uh, scale. Look, look and I, well, I don't control the answer to that question, right? But I am going to propose that that become open. Mm -hmm. All right. It, it, now, doesn't mean completely open, but right. we need to open it up, yeah. and so we're gonna we're gonna at least put that on the right. decision makers' table. So, well, the level of anti neutrinos in the room is rising, mm -hmm. and uh, and we have another session we have to turn to, which is a, a, an honor we're, we're about to give. But please join me in thanking Robert and Susan for coming to today. And <laughs>